FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz, and it's September 20th, 2017. Well, Trump had a big speech yesterday at the UN, and we're going to talk about it. First, though, feel free to send us emails, kl at kerrylutz.com, whatever is on your mind. I'm only about 35 or 40 behind right now. Got a little backed up during the storm when I had to evacuate. But Ivan Elin is here with us now. You know, Ivan Well, Senior Fellow Director, Center on Peace and Liberty at the Independent Institute. Ivan, welcome back. Thanks for having me back, Kerry. Hey, so Trump gave his, uh, I guess, his coming out speech at the UN yesterday. And uh, it was uh, provocative. Some of the mainstream media didn't understand it. Others uh, understood it but didn't want to, and others still were applauding it. What's your take on it? Well, I think he made a few good points. You know, he was putting them on notice that people are going to have to do more for their uh, security uh, and that nations could uh, cooperate even though they, you know, they guard their sovereignty. And, of course, he wants to guard U.S. sovereignty uh, the most. However, of course, his realism, he said at principle he was following a policy of principled realism. Then he sort of got into what sounded like a a, a redux of the uh, acts of evil speech, um, talking about rogue nations supporting terrorism, that sort of thing. And then he got into the three. He substituted uh, Venezuela for um, Iraq and the acts of evil, but North Korea and uh, Iran were still there. And so he was berating them for their internal uh, human rights violations, which is definitely true. There was nothing he said that was false there. But uh, if you're a realist and you're paying attention to uh, people's external policies instead of their internal policies, there was sort of a contradiction in the speech in that regard. So I have to see you know, what he does. Uh, he threatened North Korea again with uh, basically nuclear war for the second time, which is probably not helpful. I think he's maybe painting himself into a corner. And he also uh, said that the Iran uh, agreement, nuclear agreement, would be uh, looked at again, which is, I'm not sure they're going to get anything better than that. And the the experts say that North or that Iran is following it. So if you don't want to fight a two-front war, and generals usually don't like to do that at the same time, they should probably keep the Iran deal in place, at least for a while, um, while they're dealing with North Korea, because that's a more urgent threat. They already have nuclear weapons, whereas Iran is uh, trying to develop them along with the missiles. And, but the, but the North Korea already has the missiles, and they, they're getting the missiles of Iran, or excuse me, they already have the nuclear weapons, and uh, they're getting missiles of a range that could eventually hit the continental United States. So that's a little bit more of a... Uh, uh, urgency at this point. So some people have likened his tone to, uh, or his uh, goals, his aims, to uh, almost Jacksonian in nature, which is like America first, we'll take care of our people, we'll help our allies, but we're not going to fight your wars for you. Yeah, I think uh, he is definitely a Jacksonian. He's not a neoconservative like George W. Bush, who had a you know, we wanted to promote democracy everywhere. And of course, he's not a liberal interventionist like Hillary is. He he actually bears some res- resemblance to Obama, who is a realist as well. But uh, Obama sort of deviated from that, uh, uh, you know, every so often. And, you know, Trump may do that as well. But I think, you know, Trump and Obama are more in the realist category. And uh, Trump is in the Jacksonian realist category, which means that he doesn't really Really, he wants to limit our military intervention, but when he does do it, he wants to smash the um, enemy that he thinks is, uh, you know, a problem. And uh, doing so, apparently, with multiple enemies at this point. Well, one thing that I read a while back, and I can't quote it exactly. I, did, I should have saved the article, but one of the generals was uh, either testifying or being interviewed. And he said that Trump basically has stopped micromanaging the war in Afghanistan 
says, all right, guys, you're responsible. You're, you're on the ground. We don't really know what's going on, at least not like you do. We can't micromanage the war from the White House situation room. And it's up to you to, uh, to effectively do what needs to be done here. So he's given his people on the ground, uh, his commanders, more latitude and more freedom to make the decisions. Uh, one has to question whether they've been uh, denuded for so long and neutralized, whether whether they're in a position to actually make decisions anymore. And, you know, that was always the strong point, Ivan, of the American military is like one guy has gone Somebody steps into his place, you know, the bottom up type operation instead of top down, which which is typical of of, well, the former Soviet Union and uh, and many of our adversaries today, where if the if the head is gone, then the body can't function. Yeah, I think uh, it's a good idea to, when you get into a war, to let the military run it to, to a certain extent. And I think the Republicans are a bit better about that than the Democrats have historically been with LBJ in Vietnam, Obama, with some of his uh, micromanagement. Uh, and Clinton, I think, was uh, somewhat micromanaging, too. The Bushes, both Bushes tended to let the military do more when they got into wars. And I think Trump is uh, along that those lines. However, I think you have to you do have to have some civilian input because uh, and, the, and the input comes like, do you want to keep doing the war that we're already in or do you want to do the war in the at all, if you haven't gotten into it yet, those are civilian decisions. And uh, so, once the war starts, I think the commander in chief uh, can handle it. But I think even Congress, uh, Congress is supposed to be involved in uh, under the Constitution in deciding whether we go to war or not. And we don't really do that anymore since Harry Truman didn't do it in Korea. And so, uh, you know, sometimes presidents, as a courtesy, come and get. Uh, approval. And the Bushes were also better about that, but uh, of Congress. But but the question is, uh, do you really want to go into some of these places? And should we even be in Afghanistan? It's been 16 years since we did this. And then the one thing the military does have a problem with is once they get into a place, they don't want to leave because they want to win it. And yeah. I guess that's understandable if you're a military a person, but after 16 years, the civilians probably ought to start saying, "Well, you know, is this really winnable? Uh, our military is best when we when we um, fight other militaries, and uh, we have dominance. I mean, we have the most powerful military in world history, uh, both relatively and absolutely." But it's not very good at fighting uh, guerrillas, and that's what we're facing. Um, you know, all the a lot of the theaters that we're in, all the seven wars we're now fighting, um, most of them are uh, guerrilla war again, counterinsurgency warfare against guerrillas. And so I think you know there probably needs to be a pruning of some of those efforts. And Afghanistan might be at the top since. Uh, we have supposedly dismantled a lot of the networks in Pakistan uh, and Afghanistan. And I'm not sure how long we can keep our finger in the dike. Uh, the Taliban has certainly not been, um, you know, uh, put in the box there. But, of course, we're our primary enemy when we first went in there, we only— we're attacking the Taliban and taking them out because they were supporting Al Qaeda, and uh, there's really not too much Al Qaeda activity there anymore. So um, I think we should they, these wars, which are all undeclared, really, except for the Afghan war. But that resolution has been stretched to the max to all these other places, and probably that out that resolution is outdated itself since it was passed in, you know, uh, 2001. So. Uh, Congress refuses to, to get involved. Rand Paul tried to bring it up recently uh, to expire the old resolutions of the Iraq and the Afghanistan resolution and then pass new ones. But uh, he didn't get any. They didn't even bring it to the floor because they, they're scared to vote on war anymore. And that's their that's one of their primary functions in yeah. Congress. So the Congress is really left the field, abdicated its uh, constitutional role. And I think so. So the president really, you know, was in charge of this stuff now. So he ought, really ought to evaluate some of these uh, wars that instead of just, uh, you know, keeping them on autopilot or even accelerating. Yeah. Well, hey, look at con from Congress's standpoint, uh, if uh, if the war doesn't go well, which most of them haven't, uh, hey, we didn't do it. We had no part of it. It wasn't our idea. And if they do go well, they can take credit and say, well, we funded it. So 
they're kind of like in a no lose situation there. Right. That's exactly what they're they're up to. I'm afraid. Yeah. Which uh, which is like you said, an abdication of their con- of their constitutional duties. Uh, only Congress can declare war, right? And even under the War Powers Act. Still, you're supposed to bring them home in 90 days, the troops home in 90 days, if there's no declaration of war. So just yet another example of why Congress is held in uh, such low esteem by by all of you out there and uh, and us as well. Yes. And I think, uh, you know, back in the old days, uh, before 1950 is what I'm really talking about here, Congress exercised their role perfectly. And uh, I'm afraid that this system, uh, there are more since then in the modern world here, the members are looking out for themselves rather than the institution. James Madison and the other founders thought that the system would have checks and balances. Everybody would act to defend their own institution, you know, the president, the Congress, the Supreme Court, etc. But uh, they didn't realize that the uh, sovereignty has gone down to a personal level and the uh, members, as you say, are more interested in getting reelected rather than sticking up for the constitutional imperatives of the Congress and uh, actually fulfilling their constitutional role of not only de- declaring war, but the first wars we've had in this country were completely managed by Congress and the president merely executed uh, what they did just as he did domestically. He was supposed to be the executor of the policy uh, overseas as commander in chief and at home, you know, as chief enforcement officer of the law. And uh, that was supposed to be his limited role. Of course, we're far beyond that with the imperial presidency now. Interesting. So, so yeah, that is a great point that that the whole system is kind of broken down. And now it's uh, basically the president's there. He's got the power. And if Congress doesn't like it, it's up to them to do something about it rather than, you know, they're in a totally reactive position rather than being the driver of the policy, which is the way it was in the uh, good old days. And right, we wind up, uh, we lose uh, some of the uh, legitimacy of the constitution of our laws and our system of uh, checks and balances with the way things are now. How does Congress uh, take the power back or do they want to even? Well, I think you have to work on internal incentives. I think in the old days, we had more party discipline in Congress. And now with the um, advent of, you know, uh, communications and transportation, I mean, these guys can, uh, you know, they're in session all the time. And also they can get their own media. They're their own media show. They can go on CNN, the local TV stations uh, where they where they're representing from are the key places. And they get they can just call the station and go, hey, I want to I want to get on. And of course, they're going to let the senator from the state or the representative from that congressional district, they're going to let them on the local news. And that's how they get reelected. And so, you know, they're their own. They raise their own uh, campaign money a lot of times now. And of course, you know, they're their they're, they're their own mouthpiece. And so there's very little party discipline in Congress anymore. Um as we saw in the Obamacare. And I, I, I would predict the same thing will probably happen on this round of Obamacare. Um, but uh, so I think, you know, they, there's ideological positions of the two parties, but uh, they don't really owe their re- election to it. And a war, they're very scared of that for the reason that you just mentioned. Nobody wants to vote for a losing war and nobody wants to vote against a winning war, like, uh, for instance, Desert Storm, it was a smashing victory. And a lot of those Democrats said that voted for it, uh, they got, they got, uh, you know, they weren't reelected. And so I think that taught the Democrats at least the lesson, and probably the Republicans too, that you don't want to vote against a war that goes well. Of course, you never know if it's going to go well yeah. before you vote for it. So that's why they avoid voting for it. Well, Certainly for the first Iraq war, there was a definite support among uh, the populace, among the country for it. Uh, the second one, not so much. I think Afghanistan, there probably was support for it. But uh, also, you know, it's like, what's the, the definition of uh, the word is? Uh, it's what's the definition of war now? Uh, nation building is that really part of war, Ivan? Is that 
did, did our forefathers ever contemplate us taking these countries and trying to uh, make them into like mini little Americans, Americas? Uh, no. In fact, uh, George Washington uh, said that we should, uh, um, you know, trade with other countries, but stay out of the politics of, uh, of uh, other nations uh, not get into permanent alliances. And then Thomas Jefferson came by and said that we shouldn't do entangling alliances. And so, of course, they would not have agreed with this at all, uh, exporting democracy to, through the barrel of a gun. They were more, let's lead by example. And I think, you know, that's our record of taking democracy to other countries at gunpoint out of about 18 times since 1900, we have only succeeded four times. So this policy, governments just don't seem to learn from their policies. Uh, so we've got to, you know, we've got to really um, uh, hold them to task. And, and unfortunately, Americans, they forget about what happened yesterday because they're leading their lives and that sort of thing. Right. And, and the distant federal government seems like the distant federal government until we get into a war and it's sapping all the money and whatever, but we don't have a draft anymore. So people yeah. even pay less attention uh, to the wars. And I'm not advocating a draft because I think it uh, contravenes liberty. But that's one of the side uh, uh, effects of not having conscription is that uh, during the Vietnam War, people knew about it and they, they didn't like it. Uh, and it took yeah. a while for them not to like it, just as it did in the Iraq War. But uh, certainly when these things drag on and don't seem to be in the national security interests and are costing lives and lots of money, people start uh, turning against it. But uh, nowadays, uh, the, the, the president is insulated from some of that. He doesn't have, there's no military draft. We don't really know how much these wars cost uh, yeah. because we don't really have uh, good estimates, uh, that sort of thing. And so and we don't have a Congress who is willing to say, listen, we got to get out of this thing. And that's what Congress should probably be saying right now in Afghanistan. Yeah. Yeah. I think the time has come. Uh, and, uh, you know, we we go into these wars without specific goals and uh, therefore there is no definition of victory. And and then we're just there. And Afghanistan, of course, has become the longest running war in the country's history and and with no end in sight. So. Yes, and they have not told us what victory is going to look like. We didn't have victory with 100,000 soldiers there in 2010, which was at the height of our our uh, uh, troop numbers. Now we've got, like, we're, when they add the 4,000, 4, we'll have about 16,000 on the ground. So you can tell that if they didn't win it with 100,000, they're probably not going to do so with uh, 16,000. Yeah. It's very misguided, and I think it's Trump just saying, okay, we'll give it one last go around. But I think his his disposition is to get out of there, but try to leave something uh, so the Taliban don't take the place over again, because then we'll just be back. Right. I mean, that's kind of the thing. Are we? Well, it depends. It depends on how the Taliban reacts. I mean, they they weren't too thrilled with bin Laden the first time, but they were sort of uh, motivated by this. Pashtun, strict Pashtun um, hospitality code that says yeah. you're not supposed to, you know, Obama, or excuse me, uh, Osama bin Laden was a guest there, yeah, and uh, they didn't really want to give him up. So uh, I don't think they were really too happy that Al Qaeda uh, had bombed the World Trade Center and Pentagon. And I think they, you know, because they were hosting him. And of course, the attack wasn't planned there. It was planned in Hamburg, Germany. So, um, you know, Afghanistan is not really a strategic country from the U.S. from from any sort of other reason. So uh, I think we've we've wiped out most of the terrorist infrastructure in Pakistan uh, and Afghanistan, that, that theater. So I think it's, you know, also the Taliban, people do learn their lessons. We're not the only one that learned lessons. And the Taliban got their regime wiped out in 2001 when they hosted terrorists. So they may not be motivated to do that again. We'd have to see, and we might have to go back, but it's not, not necessarily guaranteed. And I think if we did go back, we could go back with airstrikes and drone strikes and that sort of thing and uh, kind of keep the place uh, from uh, from training camps, which you can see, you know, very easily if there's training camps around 
Uh, we could easily take those out and that sort of thing. So it's manageable. We don't have to have troops on the ground rebuilding the country. Now, Trump insisted he's not going to do any nation building. But if he's training the Afghan forces and that sort of thing, um, he's definitely doing some nation building there still. Yeah, well, I guess we're just going to have to see how it works out. And maybe we have worse things to worry about than Afghanistan. Maybe it's time. Uh, at least he didn't set a deadline when all the troops are going to be removed to give them, uh, you know, a uh, a starting date or a, a just lay back and wait date. Like Yeah, Obama I think did. that's where Obama made a big mistake by doing that in Afghanistan was setting a date. And of course, but it, whether you send a date, whether, whether you set a date or not in many of these places, those people live in the country. They'll outweigh you like the Vietnamese. They they had four foreign occupiers. We were just the last one. You know, and they had they, they just waited because it was their country. And they knew that if they waited around long enough, the U.S. and uh, and the French and, and the Japanese and the French again, you know, they they, they left. They all left eventually. Yeah. So eventually so, they uh, leave, you know, <laughs> and same in Afghanistan. I mean, the yeah. Brits, how many years did they try to subjugate the place? Well, they tried three. They had three wars. The Soviets had a war in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And uh, somehow we thought it would be different. Uh, this is a very decentralized country. And we're trying to put a central government in there. So that our nation building doesn't even fit with the, the culture of the country. So I'm yeah. I'm not sure how this is going to work out. Mm -hmm. right, you know. Yeah, agreed. Well, hey, that's it for now. So Ivan, uh, where's the best place to find your work these days? Uh, well, I wrote a book called uh, um, The Failure of Counterinsurgency, and I also uh, work for the Independent Institute at www.independent.org. All right. And we'll always have a link. And any questions for Ivan and myself, email us at kl at kerrylutz.com. Twitter feeds at Kerry Lutz and the Facebook page is Financial Survival Network. Ivan, thanks for coming on. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, Kerry. Appreciate it. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.